Furthermore, with African-American males, you know, I speak at a lot of graduations all across the country. And one of the things that always hurts my heart is I don't see a whole lot of black males graduating. There are more black males in the penal system than there are in higher education. This is not a good situation. Anybody who's in the educational arena knows that young black males are good students, kindergarten, first grade, second grade, just like anybody else. As they start to get into the older grades, something begins to happen. You know, that peer pressure begins to kick in, they want to be cool. And then, you know, thinking about fifth grade, they start reading about this great nation of ours, and it is a great nation. But they notice that there's nobody who looks like them who really did that much. Everybody wants to know, what did my ancestors do? They say, well, maybe next year when I take world history. But next year they take world history, the same thing happens. What did my ancestors do? Where do I fit in? And then they go home and turn television on. Oh, there we are playing basketball, baseball, football, rapping in some baggy pants, acting a fool on some sitcom. You begin to get a very different impression of what success for you means. doesn't mean being the CEO of a Fortune 500 company or a nuclear physicist. And by the time they figure out that they're not going to be the next Michael Jordan or the next Puffy Daddy, you know, it's too late. It's too late. And... Now, up drives this big black BMW with tinted glass out. That's this tall guy with furs and jewels and women. You want to be like me? I can show you how to get all this stuff. Plus, that society sold you a bill of goods. Next thing you know, you're looking at television, and you see this young man being led away in handcuffs, trying to shield his face from the camera. You say, that looks like little Johnny. What happened? He was such a good boy. What happened happens to little Johnnies across this country hundreds of times every day. And it never had to happen. Because anybody could take a little Johnny when he was six years old and walk down the streets of Washington, D.C. and given him a black history lesson he would have never forgotten. They could have started by pointing to his shoes and say, you know, it was Jan Montzliger, a black man who invented the automatic shoe lasting machine, which revolutionized the shoe industry throughout the world. You just step on that clean street, you tell him it was Charles Brooks, a black man who invented the street sweeper, those machines with the big brushes. And down that street comes one of those big refrigerated tractor trailer trucks. You tell him it was Frederick Jones, a black man who invented the refrigeration system for trucks. And it comes to a stop at the red light, and you tell him it was Garrett Morgan, a black man who invented the traffic signal. And while you're talking about him, how he invented the gas mask, they saved lots of lives during the war. And while you're talking about the war, Henrietta Bradbury, a black woman who invented the underwater cannon, made it possible to launch torpedoes from submarines. And then you'll see a beautiful black woman walking down the street. A black man did not invent her, but <laughs> you can use that opportunity to talk about Madam C.J. Walker, a black woman who invented cosmetic products for women of dark complexion, was the first woman of any nationality in America to become a millionaire on her own efforts. And you'll walk past the hospital and you'll talk about Charles Drew and his contributions to blood banking and the understanding of blood plasma. Daniel Hell Williams, the first successful open heart surgery in the world, had an operative mortality rate less than 1.5%. You look up at that surgical light, Thomas Edison. You didn't know he was black, did you? <laughs> well, actually, he wasn't. But his right-hand man, Louis Latimer, was. And you can tell how Louis Latimer came up with the filament that made the light bulb work for more than two or three days, how he invented the electric lamp, did pioneering work, incandescent and fluorescent light, diagram the telephone for Alexander Graham Bell, was a tremendous inventor in his own right. Most people have never even heard of him. You walk past the railroad tracks. Andrew Beard, the automatic railroad car coupler, spurred on the Industrial Revolution. Elijah McCoy, the automatic lubrication system for locomotive engines. In fact, Elijah McCoy had so many great inventions that when something new would come out, people would say, is that a McCoy? Is that the real McCoy? You got racist people like David Duke talking about the real McCoy. Don't even know who they're talking about. But... Uh, <laughs> But, but you can see, you know, that, that young man has no reason to believe that his ancestors didn't play a very important role in developing this country. He should feel fully invested in it. He should feel 
in every way an important part of this nation because sometimes people don't feel that they are important enough. And therefore, they don't think you should be wasting your time on them. We have to disabuse people of that notion. We have to get them to know that we value every single one of them. And remember, for every one of those young people that we can keep from going down that path of self-destruction, it's one less person we have to be afraid of. One less person we have to protect our families from. One less person we have to pay for in the penal system or the welfare system. One more tax-paying, productive member of society who may discover a new energy source or the cure for cancer. We can't afford to throw any of them away. We need every single one of them. And we need to begin to help all of our people understand how incredibly valuable they are.